We've gotten real good at style that has lost substance because people want quick fixes. And sometimes what it is is just telling people, I need you to hear that God hasn't given up on you. Hello, and welcome back to the Firebrand Podcast. I am Maggie Ulmer, and I am here today on Zoom with Scott Kisker, David Watson, and our special guest today, Dr. Joy Moore. Hello, Joy. Hi, Joy. Hi, so glad glad to be here with you. Yes, thank you. Um, We're glad you're here, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So Great great to visit with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Joy is on the editorial board of Firebrand Magazine, and we always appreciate her wisdom and her voice during the meetings. And um, And today we figured we would talk about something very appropriate, preaching. Go figure. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. So, we talk- well, we haven't actually introduced you very Yes, much. I know. This oh, is correct. I was going to say, like, be good that people know why we're talking to her about preaching that's true we've all had the pleasure of hearing you preach i think so well i'm glad you prefaced that with pleasure thanks (laughs) (laughs) well of course and it's very sincere so please joy tell our listeners who may not be familiar with you why we're talking to you about preaching and also just tell us a little bit about yourself okay so let's see I was born nine months. Oh, no, that's too far back. (laughs) Uh, I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, and I've served several churches in the Michigan area and uh, one in Indiana. And uh, but um, my uh, primary role, which I'm currently serving in, is as professor of biblical preaching, um, where I teach at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. So um, it's kind of what I do both in practice and in profession. Um, I like to call myself an ecclesial storyteller, uh, which means I seek to encourage theologically framed, biblically attentive, and socially compelling interpretations of Christian scripture in order to understand the critical issues influencing community formation in contemporary culture. And in wow. short, in you, short you, uh, do you have that memorized? That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh my God. In shorthand, that means I tell community forming stories from the Bible as a follower of Christ. Wowza. I like that you're a professor of biblical preaching. Yeah. (laughs) Because we've all heard the other kind, too. Yes, we have. Too often. (laughs) Where where you get done and you're like, wait, what was the text again? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I'm just curious, just as a side note, um, is, is teaching the discipline of biblical preaching, is that different than teaching homiletics? Homiletics is um, actually um, more about the um, discipline of crafting and um, and stuff, uh, uh, communicating, Mm -hmm. uh, sermons. Um, and so it's um, the, the reason that we do this is we're doing this for uh, more for pulpit pastors than for academics. Gotcha. Uh, so, um, but one of the interesting things that comes up is uh, we have to uh, almost give an apology for why we focus on the Bible. I, I literally have students ask me that um, and that's why we call it Foundations for Biblical Preaching is because um, a lot of people, as you've already alluded to, have heard some great talks from the pulpit um, and don't know the distinction between what is proclamation and what is just a good word. And some of us have heard mediocre talks from the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> With the same... <laughs> Yes. Some of us have given some mediocre talks from the pulpit. I <laughs> mean, confessing today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all. It's all. I had a pastor once who said, "Out of um, four weeks of preaching, you're going to preach, hopefully, two really good ones, one kind of okay one, and probably one stinker at least." And I feel like. You know, I, one of the first sermon I ever preached was at this 
little country church in Archer, Texas. I always feel like I need to go back and apologize to those people. <laughs> oh my gosh. Every time I have to talk in front of a group of people, I feel like I end with, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is a craft that, that you get better at if you work at it over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a practice. Yeah. Which yeah. is why having one class is insufficient. <laughs> You just, yeah, right, right. It, it's I not mean, information, it's it's practice. Yeah. yeah so and, what and I think that that's what the best training I got was the pastor I was interning with gave me the first service for the entire summer. Yeah. And then every week it got recorded. We would watch it together Ooh. and critique it. That's brutal. And it was painful, but yeah, effective. Mm -hmm. You know, know. that's apprenticing. Mm -hmm. We just forget that if you're learning a craft, Mm -hmm. like you you, you expect to be apprenticed, right? Well, that's that's what you just described, Scott, is developing the craft. It's finding your voice um, because we all, you know, the, the statement you made a moment ago, Maggie, when when I say something as you're gonna find out through this this podcast um i might drop a gem and then the rest of my paragraphs are like why is she opening her mouth (laughs) but you you keep going until the gem falls and that's what those one or two good sermons are and the rest of them just sort of are the filler yeah gosh well what do you think makes a good sermon oh so we're gonna we're gonna back up to a good sermon not a great sermon <laughs> well, well, what, well what is Look, a great keep sermon the bar I mean... low. reach for that brass ring of mediocrity and <laughs> let's call well, it well i i mean i i i do as a in my parenting i have told my sons it is it is wonderful to have big dreams and those are are beautiful things but you know exceeding expectations is a delightful experience. It's always my favorite thing. And it usually happens when expectations are a little lower, but not of God, never of God. So what, what, what makes a good sermon Mm -hmm. is uh, it kind of goes along what Jesus said. Mm. Uh, There's, there's no one good, but God, a good sermon's about God. Amen. (laughs) Well, what makes a great sermon then? Well, I did look up great. When okay. I got the request and, and great is unusual or comparatively large, hmm. considerable in degree, power, and intensity. First rate, extremely notable, exceptionally outstanding, highly significant or consequential. And I like those words in, in relationship to crafting a sermon. Hmm. So, so speaking in front of people, I'm very struck by this actually, because speaking in front of people often terrifies me. And um, because God has an excellent sense of humor, I find myself doing it on a reasonably regular basis. It's horribly sanctifying for me in the worst possible ways. But the, so I prefer writing as a way of communicating things. And in that description of great are missing all of the things I would say I strive for in writing, but like, I'm, I, I feel like I construct things I miss. So if somebody said that's a great sermon, they might not be like all the transitions were perfect. Do you know what I'm saying? So I actually, I, I actually have five, um, uh, five things that I look for, um, that I, I offer my students. And, and I, I actually use the term an exceptional sermon would be, um, Mm -hmm. and in, in actuality, um, you have very few exceptional sermons because an exceptional sermon would hit all of these, Mm -hmm. um, and they would be, uh, captivating, biblically theological, engaging, convincing, and imperative. But I'd have to flesh out each of those ideas. Mm -hmm. 
So by captivating, I mean, it nudges us immediately toward the focus and it hooks us by the end. So we're drawn in, we stay engaged, and there's a, a, a understanding that comes by the end. Mm -hmm. It commands our attention. Um, uh, biblically theological is that it has enough scripture and scriptural content to tell the full, broad, deep, and rich story of God and God's activity in the world. So uh, as one of my colleagues said, God should get some big verbs. <laughs> God is active. You know, don't say God is good. Describe God's activity so that people go, that's God? Ah, it's good. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it should invite us into the narrative behind the text. So too many people will get an idea and mm -hmm. they will run with the idea and you put that text that they took the idea from back in the context. And that's not what it is saying at all. So it should invite us into the text. Um, and then um, it should keep us in the episode and convey relevance for our place in front of the text. Hmm. So I'm in the text, I'm behind the text and I'm in front of the text. And that's being sufficiently biblical. And then engaging, um, I simply say to my students, let the text do the heavy lifting. Uh, and that basically means if you tell the story sort of like Nathan did with David. Mm -hmm. hope you, okay, I hope our listeners have enough of biblical. Yes. You no, know, I'm getting behind. I so hope so too. <laughs> But, but what Nathan did with David is what Jesus did repeatedly in the parables. And that is to tell a story that caused people, whether they were fishermen or women or fathers or uh, farmers or tax collectors, because that's all the imagery that Jesus was using, that tells a story that causes us to say, wait a minute, I get that. And then when people get angry with you, you can say, wait a minute, I didn't say anything. I just repeated the story. Yeah. And that's what happened with Nathan and David. David was convicted. And then Nathan said, oh, you asked me who the man is. Dude, that's you. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so let the text do the heavy lifting. And then convincing has to do with, with closing. So you talked about those transitions and mm -hmm. um I'll go back and talk about stickable ideas and things like that. But uh, the clo it closes with a calculated clarity. Um, and the best closing would tie everything together that leads us into action from a position of awe of the presence of God, of God being present, of God's power, and of God's promise for peace. And then the imperative is that it encourages worship of the God made known in Jesus, hope in the claims of the gospel, and acts of service to others that is a testimony to the church as a glimpse of the kingdom of God. So it comes full circle. It's not just information. It actually, and this is the work of the Holy Spirit, it actually transforms us so that we become a glimpse of the reign of God. That would be an exceptional sermon. Dang, Joy, that's really good. <laughs> Little job security there. <laughs> <laughs> so your your theory, your 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 kind of um, your understanding of preaching relies very heavily on the notion of divine agency. That God is the one who's really doing the heavy lifting. Absolutely. And we become kind, we become conduits of the work that God is doing through the proclamation of his word. Absolutely. Uh, I, when I, when I uh, worked in LA, I learned that if you wanted to work for Disney, they didn't want you to be as creative as Walt Disney. They wanted you to be willing to display what Walt Disney had created. So that's why you dress up as a princess or as a duck or as a mouse. Um, what they're 
asking you to do is to point to what the creator has created. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge the God, the creator God made known in Jesus. And we point to where God has shown up and shown out in the world. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Scott, I'm curious. Go ahead, David. Well, I was going to say, I sometimes think about preaching the way Brevard Childs would talk about um, exegesis. He said, if you want to be a better exegete, you need to become a better person. And sometimes Mm -hmm. I think preaching um, is kind of like that in the sense that you can't offer people what you don't have. You can't um, you can't proclaim what you have not internalized yourself, mm-hmm. uh, or at least not authentically. Mm-hmm. Yes Go ahead, Joel. No. Yeah, yes and no. Um, and I've, I've been greatly shaped by Childs. Um, but the reason I say yes and no is, is one, as a Wesleyan, um, we know that John Wesley wasn't totally convinced of all that Peter Moeller had said to him or the Moravians had conveyed to him. And so he began to to preach the gospel until he saw it work. And then he preached it because he'd seen it work. Uh, but I, I, I had the testimony of two um, 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 pro- professors of preaching who were uh, ahead of me, um, both who tell the story. And in fact, an- another uh, is uh, Billy Graham uh, tells a story like this too, of, of preaching or conveying the words And then having such an incredible response by the listeners that they sent the people back and said, let me explain to you what I'm trying to say. And the second call for it, so do you want some of this? More people came forward. And I have two colleagues who said they realized they didn't believe what they were preaching until they saw God work through their preaching. And both of these people were retired at the end of their careers. Mm. Mm. But do you think they became um, more effective or better or truer preachers after those experiences? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, And the reason that it was effective is because what they were, what they were conveying was the faith passed down to us. Mm-hmm. And realized they hadn't been totally converted by it. And once they were converted by it, again, this is like Wesley, they wouldn't stop. Yeah. That's the Jeremiah yeah. fire in my bones. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And I mean, of course, you know, every preacher is also just a human being, right? Whose faith goes, you know, uh, over a, a 30 year career. Right. I mean, your faith goes through ebbs and flows and there are going to be some points where it just doesn't matter whether you are feeling it because Jesus rose from the dead. Anyway. Right. I mean, you know, these sermons where people preach Easter and they're not sure Jesus rose from that. I'm like, I actually don't care what you think. (laughs) Not the time or the place. Uh, And you may be having a crisis of faith uh, and that's, you know, for you to take up with the Holy Spirit later, not while you're in the pulpit. Amen. That's true. Yeah. So if, if it's proclamation, it's not me talking about how I'm doubting. It's me telling you what I believe. And that goes back to what David was saying. You, you, you can't. Well, even what is believed, right? Yeah, what is, be- yes, what it's is believed, believed, right? Even if I'm doubting this morning or this week or this year. Because yeah, when you it's stand not in the about pulpit. You. You right. Know. When you stand in the pulpit, you are standing as a representative of Christ and his church. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're whatever you happen to believe on that day is not particularly relevant. You are there to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the faith once and for all entrusted to the saints. Period stop. Yeah, we're but not we here do to hope worship. that you believe it. <laughs> We do hope that you believe it. It's one of those things people yeah. want to figure you out. You know, it's like a kid. A kid can tell if you're faking it. Well, the children of God can tell if you're faking it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can. Yeah. 
This is interesting. This makes it actually, I'm, I just got back from a ministry trip with spirit and truth and um, I will readily confess that, that I try to um, get out of doing any of the evening speaking because it scares the bejesus out of me. Excuse my language. Um, and, <laughs> and, but I couldn't, I had to. People who testify mm-hmm. to in, in a, in a, in a post theistic context, you know, in, in a world where people don't even assume the existence of God, mm. for us to proclaim that there is a God and that this God is good mm-hmm. and that this God hasn't given up on the world, that should cause people to say, okay, tell me about this God. And as soon as you've got permission to do there, then you should just talking about the God who slung the stars in the sky and who mm-hmm. pushed the uh, land back so that the water knew how far to come up on the shore. And the God who who told the sun where to hide in the evening. This is the God who um, overcame the most powerful nation and its military to uh, free his people to bear witness to the fact mm-hmm. that God hasn't given up on the world. And when God's people kept walking out on the story, sort of like the first couple did in that ancient story, mm-hmm. God took on human flesh and said, let me show you what it means to be an icon of the creator. And that's what we see in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And when you start telling that story and then you move it all the way forward to say, here's a person in our community, in our denomination, in my life, mm-hmm. who demonstrated this kind of grace, this kind of God action, people are, will lean in and say, I want some of that. That's yeah. the best story ever told. Mm-hmm. And that's what we, we have the privilege of telling. And it's awesome. It is awesome. I need to get over myself. Um, <laughs> uh, so Scott, what was the question that you had for Joy? I'm curious. Well, I, this is, you know, so I preach, I preach weekly to a, a small rural congregation of about 50 people. Kudos to you. Yes. And yet, like the whole, I, I, I find myself intimidated by the production of mm-hmm. preaching that goes on with these guys and gals who have their personal trainers and their you know, staff who are, you know, picking out, you know, doing the PowerPoint. And so like, you know, how do you, how do you, do you find that young preachers are intimidated, as intimidated as I am by the expectation of high production value, uh, that at least when I, you know, when I first was coming up, this just wasn't the same thing. Like people, you know, people might listen to a sermon on the radio, but they weren't, you know, watching sermons, you know, in these mega churches. And it, I don't know, it just seems to have, um, you know, and I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like barely getting the, uh, the exegesis done and, you know, writing the thing, let alone having PowerPoints and video clips and, you know, all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, it's just, I'm just wondering, I, it feels like uh, preaching in the 21st century uh, is has this sort of sense of heaviness and performance and production that, I mean, and maybe it was always there, you know, probably to some degree, but it just seems in a, like, you know, cranked up to 11 you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree with you on that. Yes, it's been there in different ways. Um, right now, what people um have become used to is um more than the talking heads that we see on television, and and the reason I say more than that is I remind my students um. Uh, before Oprah Winfrey's show went off the air, the last season. They they filmed behind the scenes and it was real informative because Oprah would be talking and she would 
she would say something great and her team would capture it. And then they would say, when the cameras are rolling, you have to say that. And that's how she got perfect is, mm -hmm. is because they caught all of those best things. And, and people think that when they're looking at these things on television, that it's, you know, it's just spontaneous, like, like this podcast. And it's not, it's, it's, it's been, it's been nuanced what you're talking about. And that becomes the expectation, except for think of how many people are listening to spontaneous podcasts. Mm. They could only be binging on Netflix, but they're listening to talk shows. They're listening to talk shows or, or think of, how many people have that uncle or that aunt at every family table who starts to talk and everybody's fork is mid, you know, air listening. You're not going to say, oh, you want to hear the rest of this story? Hold on. Let me pull out my computer and I've got a PowerPoint to go with this. No, that person is a great communicator and people are still drawn by those simple capacity to tell a good story. What Marvel and Star Wars and all of that has going for it right now mm -hmm. is the continuous thread based on an original story. And when people get upset, it's because they deviate from the original story. Mm -hmm. And what we have, which I said a moment ago, is the best story ever told. And we need to tell it. And, and I encourage my students, if you have to use a PowerPoint, it's probably because you didn't do the work. I want you to work with your words so you create a movie in your listeners' minds. That's harder work. That's true. I also think that the high production value stuff I, I do think that that was a more significant part of church life back when the church growth movement was really booming. Yeah. I think today, and I think, I think baby boomers really responded well to that, but I think today um, people, a lot of people would, would look at the kind of high production value stuff and think, this is a show. Yeah. I'm being sold something. Yep. That's usually and, <laughs> me, I mean, me too, but we're all kind of cynical Gen X types here. But, this is true. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think especially for, for younger folks, at least in my conversations, they want something, they want to know that what you're saying is real, that you mean it, um, and that it's authentic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and that i think is a lot more important now and it probably always has been but it's a lot more important than the kind of production value that one gets if you have you know a movie clip from whatever the avengers or something the big lebowski yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you could work that into a sermon, that would really be no. impressive. You pay attention. I know that. <laughs> it would have to be a short clip. <laughs> well, you know, we I had this really interesting experience not too long ago where I was speaking with a young woman who is growing in her faith. She's a little kind of a baby Christian. And by young woman, I mean, she's like 23, maybe. And that feels very young to me. <laughs> um. She, yeah, <laughs> everyone on this podcast, she, we were talking and just talking one-on-one -on -one and she was listening very raptly to just something I was saying about who Jesus is. And she stopped. She said, how do you know it's true though? How do you know it's true? And it was interesting because thinking about all this production stuff, I had this very acute moment in my head where I thought the next thing you say has to be real Maggie like you can't come up with some canned kind of like whatever and hashtag 
Yeah. And and, the, and what was interesting was, is what I, what happened was, is really was just very, very personal to me, but it was, it worked <laughs> like, and I don't mean like I did it, you know, like I, I just mean that in the moment that was what the Holy Spirit brought to mind. So those were the words he put in my mouth. So that's what I said. And could that have been unique and specific to her? Absolutely. And also there was nothing terribly clever, smart, or flashy about it. And it rang true. There's a promise Jesus makes about the Holy Spirit giving right. you words. I'm, you know, so the very fact that what you said rang true for her mm-hmm. is another proof of truth. Mm-hmm. Because that's the promise Jesus said. And and it's like, you know, okay, um, I know it's true. Oh, you 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 believe that. And let me tell you, Jesus said that he would show up in moments like that, you know, um, but by but the, that logic, should I just show up in the pulpit? <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely, <laughs> I Give the Holy Spirit something to work with. And a part of what it means to give the Holy Spirit something to work with, Scott, because that's a real that's a real tension. And, you know, um, David mentioned, you know, that I lean on this divine activity. And so some people have taken that to mean that, you know, I just, I just show up and let God do what God's going to do. Um, we have to know our stuff, you know, I, I just because a person, let, let me, let me, let me say it this way. Um, if you're great with your hands, like a carpenter, you also could be a great surgeon because you're great with your hands, but I don't want you taking out my liver just because you can carve a a beautiful piece of of Mm -hmm. artwork. I need you to know medically what you're doing. And and the same thing is true for us. We have to know this faith that has been passed down to us. We have to know this story of God from creation to the promise of new creation. We have to know what people have said about this God and sometimes what they've said and done erroneously mm-hmm. so that when we are telling the story, we can be corrective. That's what the prophets were doing. That's what Paul is doing in his letters. That's what Jesus was doing. And for us to be Christ-like is to do the same thing. So we have to know scripture. We have to understand how to speak theologically. And we've gotten, we've gotten real good at style that has lost substance because people want quick fixes. And sometimes what it is, is just telling people, I need you to hear that God hasn't given up on you. Mm -hmm. And the question is, while you wait on God's next move, are you going to give up on God? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people need to just deal with that. And that's how the Holy spirit intrudes. I haven't answered your question. I haven't given you any go and do. I've just said, be still and know that God is God. And sometimes that's what, that's what they need. Do you think, I I feel like this might be relevant to what we're talking about is, is the fact that pastors are usually, there's relational equity in the pulpit too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I wasn't preaching to this young woman at all. We were just having a conversation, but I have relational equity with her. And so that's part of what made it all work. So she trusts you. Yeah. She trusts me. And yeah. Yeah. yeah I, that That's really important. Mm-hmm. The hard thing for me right now is not preaching week after week in a congregation. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I'm invited to go places and, the good thing about that is I can drop a firebomb and, and then run away yeah. and leave it to the pastor to put out the fire, right? Um, but without some type of integrity, without some type of trustworthiness, and mine comes from the capital of, of the pastor they trust inviting me into that pulpit in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to abuse that. Mm-hmm. But uh, a person should... That, that ethos that is a part of good communication, a person should recognize the person in the pulpit 
when they see them walking in Walmart on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. There's a discrepancy between who you are in the theater on Thursday and who you are in the sanctuary on Sunday. Nothing you say is going to ring true because your actions are going to silence even good words. That's the truth. That is the truth. Joy, I am curious because we've talked a little bit about preachers today. And I mean, just in throughout history there, I mean, there are some awesome, awesome preachers. So uh, who are some of your favorites from, from across time? Who are some of your favorite preachers? Uh, So I get, I get, this is the hardest question for me. Um, And, (laughs) and it's hard because right now, Uh, You know, we've gone through these seasons of preaching where, you know, we were looking for, you know, a person that was a good teacher, a person that was good with doctrine, a person that was, you know, able to speak to a small congregation, a a person that was able to speak to a mega auditorium. Um, But right now I'm going to drop a Wesleyan name on you. And and it really is a Wesleyan name. It's a pastor in a a college town um, in uh, Marion, Indiana. Uh, at College Wesleyan. His name is Steve Deneff. He's a pastor of College Wesleyan Church. And I I had the opportunity of sharing um, a platform with him at a camp probably 30 years ago now. Wow. And, um, uh, and, and I actually listen to him very frequently online now. And um, he is just an incredible communicator. Now he's been at this church forever. He's got a lot of credibility with them, but he's also preaching scripture in a way that I, I just really love. And he, he throws the gamut. Sometimes he's teaching, sometimes he's talking, sometimes he's uh, using an image or an illustration, but always he's biblical. Mm. And, and so I, I, I just have to give a nod to, to Steve. Um, I love, uh, going back a bit, um, uh, Richard Hayes, um, uh, and it's interesting because, uh, Richard's, uh, that scholarly voice, but when he preaches, it's still that scholarly voice, but what he does with the text is incredible. Mm. Um, I catch a lot of people off guard when I tell them that I was, um, uh, homiletically formed. Uh, growing up, uh, listening to Jeremiah Wright, uh, Pastor Emeritus at Trinity uh, United Church of Christ in Chicago. But uh, I, I went to a non-denominational church uh, and uh, my pastor, um, uh, well, I should say uh, what Dr. Wright did with all the small churches in Chicago was he he invited their them, their young people to, to uh, be exposed to music. Mm. Uh, and and so we all knew his preaching, and so I was I was I was really shaped by his preaching, uh, and it was always a biblical story with an incredible metaphor. Uh, uh, so so there, um, I'm a Wesleyan, and uh, I love reading John Wesley's content. Um, every time I read it out loud, I go, "Wow, I don't know how this sounds," but they were listening differently than we are today. Yeah, that's for sure. But but so so I just went went through went through that gamut. Um, there's a, a woman named Rachel uh, uh, Raquel Letsom, Raquel Letsom, and uh, every time I hear her preach, um, I I really love the way that she works with metaphors. Um, I love the vocabulary of Teresa Fry Brown, uh, a, another uh, incredible wordsmith. Um, um, uh, I, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, I, I think I'll stop there. I tried to cross, <laughs> cross a lot of bridges back and forth on that one. I, 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 I there's so many incredible preachers out there, mm-hmm. but I like to work with words. And, and so people that really take the time to craft a sermon really captivate my imagination. If I, if I dropped a, a, a couple of books for folks, I would go back. Um, uh, well, one would be by Ami Lee, A H M I Lee, L E E, 
Uh, she wrote a book called Preaching God's Grand Drama. Mm -hmm. God's Grand Drama. Another is Exodus Preaching by Kenyatta Gilbert. Exodus Preaching, Crafting Sermons About Justice and Hope. Uh, Kenyatta Gilbert is an incredible preacher, uh, um, tutored by one of my tutors, uh, James uh, Massey. Um, there's a book called Text Message. Um, it's actually a compilation of the centrality of scripture in preaching. And it was edited by Ian Stackhouse and Oliver Crisp. Text Message. Uh, I, I would offer that to folks. And then Old School, Fred Craddock and uh carl bart's homiletics oh yeah yeah so that's my book list that's cool that's really cool i've loved this conversation joy so i thank you for um letting me just talk about what's dear to my heart which oh, is just awesome. bearing witness to the god made known in jesus uh that's Amen. that's what i thought and that's what i try to give so thanks for inviting me on to do that there's so much more to be said about preaching. Um, but this was a good good kind of getting our feet wet. Amen. To well that. we'll have to we'll have to do this again, Joy, and get into some of these uh, deeper topics around preaching. Thanks for being on with us. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's been our podcast today, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to subscribe to the Firebrand Podcast so you don't miss fabulous, interesting conversations just like this one. We will come back to you in the next episode.